It's my uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Andres Pluchthun as our next speaker. Andres is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He's the founder of a number of biotech and pharma companies, including Meforsis, Molecular Partners, GC, G7 Therapeutics, and Vector Biopharma. Andres is the winner of the Christian Anfinson Award of the Protein, so Protein Society and, and, and many other uh, awards. His disciplinary protein engineering lab has made important contributions in antibody engineering, scaffold engineering, directed evolution, GPCR engineering, and targeted gene delivery. Andres and his uh, colleagues uh, developed the first fully synthetic antibody library, which is uh, of notable to us here at IPI. Uh, and, and as you see, uh, or you'll see in a moment, uh, uh, his title talk is Forcing Actions on Surface Receptors by Engineered Binding Molecules. Please join me in welcoming Andres Pluchthun. Many thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Tim and his colleagues for the great honor to bring me here to this fantastic symposium. Secondly, congratulations to uh, Tim and the whole team, the leadership team of the IPI for really making this happen. I think it's an enormous service to the scientific community. And thirdly, like probably uh, most of the speakers, I have also been quite influenced by reading some of his papers. And Hopefully, they have last uh, have made some educational impact. Okay, so I want to talk about binding molecules after we've heard some great uh, insight into structure of surface receptors, and uh, to to show you that they can do much more than binding. So I want to um, structure my talk into three components: the technology that is behind that. And even though we have worked, I think, on about 500 different targets in some way or another, I'll talk I'll, uh, today uh, 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 concentrate on only one, which is HER2 as a surface target, uh, comparing traditional therapeutic antibodies by paratopic DARPINs, as I'll explain, by paratopic antibodies. And then I'll use um, binding molecules to see how surface targets can be used for gene delivery. So let's start with this. So my lab, um, ha as has already been mentioned, comes from antibody engineering, making uh, synthetic SEV fab fragments and so on, bringing them to IgGs. However, these fragments, even though they, they look very nice on, on PowerPoint slides, have some limitations in biophysical properties. And so we thought perhaps we can also make other scaffolds for uh, covering this small space. And as you'll see, and, and this actually has led to two companies that have brought the antibodies to therapy and molecular partners which have brought the scaffolds to therapy. But this is a bi-directional road, as you'll see today, um, that there are good reasons to go either way. So the motivation to get into non-antibody scaffold proteins has been to enable possibilities which are very difficult to uh, establish with antibodies high valencies, higher than bispecific constructs which work inside the cell, inside the cytoplasm, which is reducing, as you know, uh, make stable fusion proteins that don't aggregate, uh, enzyme cytokines, and so on, make them very inexpensive to produce, obviously in E. coli, very tunable, different half-lives, and lots of different conjugation strategies. And so the molecules we develop for this purpose are anchorins, which are repeat proteins different from the LRRs we have seen uh, just uh, now. And uh, these are anchorin repeat proteins, and you can appreciate that we can make them by display technologies extremely complementary to the uh, target. You can see that these surfaces fit um, extremely tightly and have complementarity chemical properties. And the way this is done, is by display technology. Our favorite one is ribosome display, which we developed, I think, over 20 years ago. Um, and we have also used phage display and yeast display for specific applications. I don't want to talk about this today, but of course, I'm happy to answer questions. Now, one of the uh, 
uh, nice things about such proteins is that we can formulate them in many, very many different ways. So we can, of course, make them monovalent, very small. We can put flexible linkers in between in either orientation. We can put head-to-head um, -head or tail-to-tail -tail with a dimerization domain. We can put four together with a particular mo a module in between. We can put a non-binding spacer to, for example, push two receptors away from each other or we can put a rigid linker to put them at a particular angle, and all of these things has, have been experimentally verified. And so, just to summarize some of these approaches for therapy, um, this is one example of an anti-VEGF um, DARPIN, which is monovalent, a very high KD, has been pegylated, used in macular degeneration, and where phase three has just been completed. Um, this is an example where they have been uh, put in a string format where um, two of them bind um, activating receptors on T cells. This is 41BB. Uh, one of them is a localizing receptor that localizes these constructs to uh, uh, fibroblasts, uh, tumor associated fibroblasts, and two of them actually bind to serum albumin to extend the half life. The third example is um, in Zovibep, which has been developed as a COVID therapeutic, which is stockpiled um, in case uh, we'll, we'll need it. Um, it really has been developed from the idea to the completed phase two trial in two years, which I think is pretty, pretty remarkable, um, and has shown in phase two 80% reduction of hospitalization, emergency care, or death, independent of vaccination. And the molecule works in having um, three DARPINs, which are not exactly the same, binding to the trimeric spike, uh, where it docks into the, um, in, in, into the receptor, and two more that give it a long half-life, and that actually has, has shown very um, nice uh, clinical data. So this is sort of the technology background, and as I said, I want to focus today on only, mostly on only one target, which is HER2. This, of course, is well known to most people. It's a receptor tyrosine kinase. It has no known ligand. It's highly overexpressed in aggressive forms of breast cancer. It's a member of the EGFR family that goes from EGFR, HER2, HER3, HER4. And it forms signaling complexes with the other family members. Okay, and of course it has been uh, investigated very heavily uh, however, I still think we, we only know the surface of what's happening. So let me just summarize where we stand. So clearly there are several, um, uh, uh, several treatments in, in daily practice now. Um, anti an antibody against domain 4 um, uh, has been developed long ago by Genentech Trastuzumab under the brand name Herceptin. Pertuzumab binds to this dimerization arm. Uh, under the brand name Progetta, and of course tyrosine kinase inhibitors have also been developed. Now one of the things that we always thought was very curious, and this is from the, uh, an original paper from the Genentech team, is that trastuzumab that binds here uh, only seems to inhibit the, the formation of um, heterodimers between HER2 and HER3 in the absence of a HER3 ligand. Okay. If there is a HER3 ligand, this no longer works, but then pertuzumab works, and the other way around, it doesn't, it doesn't go. We thought this is very odd and wanted to get some structural insight because I think even with, with very mild uh, criteria, this cannot be seen as a high-resolution structure. <laughs> and so we thought we'd go for that and really uh, tackle this in a perhaps different way and go for a cryo -M structure of full length HER2 in the presence and absence of trastuzumab. And what we found, I thought, was quite remarkable. What we found was that under these conditions, trastuzumab, uh, the HER2, HER2 is not as rigid as we thought. What we discovered was actually there are two populations of HER2 in this, in this um, instance. One, this is extended, and one that is compact that has never been seen before. And the extended one is the same that has been published uh, 10 times. The, the, uh, the, the uh, compact one is new. 
And it, the, in the same experiment, the compact one is not found if you leave out the trastuzuma. And the result of this, uh, we think, is that in the compact form, this, um, this cavity where the dimerization loop docks becomes smaller and becomes inactive to take it up unless it's really forced heavily by the ligand. And I think this is part of explaining how, uh, how the system works. So, if we have now an overexpressing cell, Herb2 or HER2, that makes a lot of this uh, compound, it actually also dimerizes with itself or oligomerizes. And of course, it makes the complexes with um, HER3, as I have just mentioned. And so the result is that we are two signaling pathways going down. The one we have just talked about of this heterodimer, where the kinase, uh, the red kinase, um, phosphorylates the green tail, uh, mostly goes down the uh, P PI3 kinase act pathway. But the other one um, is also present, goes down via RAS and ERK. That's very important. And so if we now add trastuzumab, and we've shown this in a paper a number of years ago, it Trastuzumab does interesting, not inhibit the homo, uh, uh, the homo complexes. It inhibits very well, as we have just discussed, the RB2, RB3. And so what actually happens is that through this cross-feeding, and this is described in this paper, we actually generate more ligand and more HER3, so the system sets itself right back. And so... This is why we thought at the time to develop what we call biparatopic binders. And to make a long story very short, the result was if we devise a DARPIN that binds to the tip of the molecule, here shown in red, and one that binds to the main four, here shown in yellow, and link them in this particular way with a very short linker, we have a very interesting effect, as I'll show you in a moment. And the only way to explain this is that this is an intermolecular interaction, which essentially is not compatible with a normal upright position. And we think we, we force the molecules lean down and bring them apart. And so the, the uh, prerequisites is that this loop is then oriented poorly. The linker is very short. This domain is uh, oriented unusually and the TM domains are kept apart and the kinases are kept apart. And so it's very important. It's not sufficient to have simple biparatopic binding. It has to be exactly like this. Orientation, distance, linker length domain are all essential. And so the net result is, if we now look at the phosphorylation of HER2 itself, that these biparatopic molecules really diminish the phosphorylation of HER2 by itself. Whereas trastuzumab doesn't do that for the reasons I have just tried to explain. And the, this goes on downstream, that the biparatopic DARPINs inhibit both pathways. You can appreciate these are two different cell lines, that this uh, has a slight overshoot and then goes down and stays down, here in, in all cases, in both pathways, whereas um, trastuzumab has the overshoot and it returns right back to the baseline, uh, simply because it doesn't inhibit itself phosphorylation. And so therefore, we think that the signal in the presence of the biparatopic DARPINs is a pan-HER2 effect, where we essentially take out the HER2 out of the system, unable to interact with any of the other receptors. That's at least the, the model. And so this actually has a very encouraging effect in vivo, in the sense that we really uh, see a, a tumor diminishment, um, even though this is uh, not really carrying any toxin or any FC part or anything. It's just basically based on signaling in this model. So how does this exactly work? And we thought we'll first of all look in internalization. We developed a, a, a new assay which we published, I don't have time to get into this. Briefly, it's based on two fluorophores. One stays out, one stays, one goes in. And we take the ratio and therefore can measure everything at once. And so we see that in, with this control, galvanomycin and the proteasome inhibitors, er, everything stays constant. If we mix pertuzumab, trastuzumab, they don't induce the, uh, internalization, they don't induce degradation. And our biparatopic DARPINs don't do this either. 
So thus, there has to be something else going on. And so we use fluorescence recovery after, after photo bleaching. The way this was done is either her, set, uh, either her two was fused to a halo tag, which could be fluorescently labeled, or we took um, an AFI body, which binds outside of the region we're interested in, and put a, a label there. In both cases, what you can do is you shine a laser light here, then this is bleached, and it diffuses right back. And we can measure this. And so what we find is that if we take these very short linked uh, the biperatopic ones, that they essentially uh, uh, lock this down and uh, prevent all recovery, and it uh, behaves like a, like a fixed cell. And these are the controls. If we make the linker longer and give it sort of more freedom, um, there is some recovery uh, which, is, which is, however, still mild. If we compare this with the antibody, that presumably just dimerizes the receptors and they move quite freely as, as a unit. And this correlates exactly with cell viability. Uh, if we have this very short linker, we can see that at extremely low concentration, 100 picomolar, um, there is already um, uh, a great toxicity in the cells, whereas with a longer linker, this effect has vanished. And moreover, the orientation matters. This is very important. Uh, if we have the um, inactive orientation, uh, as you see in green, it the, the recovery behaves essentially like if you do nothing, untreated cells. If you have the active orientation, we can see that this uh, recovery is greatly slowed down. And again, this correlates completely with cell viability. This is the active orientation to different constructs. The inactive orientation doesn't do anything, even though these are the same dampens just switched around. They're, 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 they're chiral, remember. The, the, the cartoons don't, don't see that, but the, these are, uh, proteins are chiral molecules. Okay, so uh, if we have the naked receptor that recovers quite well, uh, with uh, trastuzumab or pertuzumab, for that matter, it doesn't, and uh, the mixture either, either way. And here, we seem to have something that looks like a daisy chain. Now, to follow this up further, we looked at the receptor dynamics at the single molecule level, and this is the movement of uh, labeled HER2 alone. If we now add a monovalent DARPIN that has the same size, it's just the other thing doesn't bind, it looks the same, the mobility is identical. Uh, I don't go through the, the detailed data, this has all been published. And if we now take this um, very active construct, we can see that this is really locked down and the movement is greatly diminished. We can make the linker longer again and you can see this effect is, is vanished. Okay. So what we can conclude there is all active DARPINs have something in common, they seem to promote the formation of daisy chaining, which is schematically shown here. So it's not just two that link, but many. Now the next question is, can we do even better than that? And can we bring, now that we know what we need to do, this lockdown mechanism back to antibodies? Would they also induce apoptosis like the DARPINs do? And if so, how would they have to be constructed? And so what we did is look at lots of constructs and take trastuzumab as sort of the upper baseline of something that is not inducing apoptosis, or trastuzumab doesn't, and the DARPINs that do, and uh, uh, check this by actually uh, a PARP digestion, which you can see this band clearly ind in indicates apoptosis, and now make a lot of constructs of single chain of V DARPIN, single chain of single chain of V, bispecific diabodies, and so on and so forth in different orientations, geometries, and so on. And so you, see, you get a whole variety of different constructs. And obviously there's some group that actually induces apoptosis by this criterion, and we were interested in what they do. And so some of them actually reach um, activities very close to the DARPINs. And so what we did is then make a very systematic search of combining all single chains to FAB in all orientations, in all domains, and a massive influence again on how you exactly do this. The geometry is key. We then took the best ones forward to a whole IgG, 
And again, a massive influence on how you exactly construct this. And even some of these constructs activate the receptor. So this is, this is important to understand. And so we finally found a molecule which we patented and also published, which we call 441, which um, of, of the many things we looked at is very, very few that have these properties. And so it has some very interesting um, abilities. So what we see here is the staining for, in blue is DARPIN, in green is a lysosomal marker, and in pink or magenta is the antibody. This is just Zuzumab itself, it just stays on the surface. This is the other antibody from which we took the variable domains, it stays on the surface. If we mix the two, both stay on the surface, but if we make this particular construct, they go in into the lysosome and then they disappear. So they not only get internalized, but they also now get degraded, which we thought is very cool. And so they also cause lockdown, as shown here, very much like the DARPINs, but unlike the DARPINs, they also are internalized and getting degraded. We thought this is very interesting. And so our result from this is that this uh, molecule has two modes of action. It creates this lockdown of massive surface um, entangling, um, clustering, reduced mobility, is then internalized and is then brought to degradation. And so this has a massive consequence on downstream signaling. So um, HER2 itself gets less. Phosphor HER2 is basically vanished. Phosphor HER3 is vanished. Uh, Phosphor ACT is vanished. Uh, Phosphor ERK depends a little bit on the cell line. And uh, the PARP you can see, which also depends a little bit on the cell line. And so this, again, has a very encouraging effect in um, animal trials, we, where we can see that this really has, a, um, as a single agent without any toxin or anything else, um, a, a, very, uh, a very encouraging effect. Let me summarize this part. So the induction of apoptosis requires that we inhibit phosphor HER2 and not just phosphor HER3. And the in induction of apoptosis strictly correlates with this HER2 lockdown. And the lockdown can be achieved with biparatopic binders of the antibody or the DARPIN type. And very, very few constructs can, in addition, cause this internalization and degradation. So let me now um, come over to another application of this, which is to use these surface targets for gene delivery. And the idea here is to essentially do something that we call paracrine delivery of biologics. So this is a tumor, which is, of course, a complicated uh, system, which has tumor cells, ideally immune infiltrates, has um, cancer-associated fibroblasts, has lymphatic vessels, has blood vessels, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to install a non-replicative virus, which makes a biofactory in the, uh, in the tissue that we're interested in, and secretes proteins, and so we call this the factory behind the enemy lines. And so, in other words, to make the therapeutic proteins right then and there that only have to diffuse locally. And we can also, of course, um, produce cytokines locally um, uh, and make a whole cocktail, and especially those which would otherwise be systemically toxic. So, in other words, we cannot only observe the tumor microenvironment, we can design it. And so we took as the basis adenovirus, however, as we'll see in a moment, is heavily engineered and doesn't have any viral genes anymore. Normally it has a huge genome and it doesn't integrate into chromosomes, that's very good. Why are we doing this? And why are we taking a non-replicative version? Most people in this field use adeno-associated virus, and I think we're relatively good protein engineers, but we cannot really make this thing bigger. And so, therefore, the coding capacity of only 4.7 kilobases is very limited. We have lots of ideas what we like to encode, and so, therefore, a bigger virus is better. Um, and here you have 35 to 36 kilobases, and you can really encode a lot of interesting things. And so, in order to do this, we have to solve three problems. We have to make the virus free of non-replicative... We have to make the virus non-replicative and free of any viral genes. We then have to make the virus target the cells of interest, and then we come back to the binding proteins. 
and we have to shield the virus from interactions with blood components and non-specific interactions with cells. And we'll need binding proteins for this as well as we'll see. Okay, so how do we do this? So this concept will be clear for anybody in the audience who's familiar with phage display. We need two genomes. One is essentially wild type and encodes everything the virus needs. And the encapsulation signal, which is a piece of DNA, which is used by the portal to bring in the DNA, is flanked by two LOX P sites. The second genome encodes everything we would like to encode, all the genes that should be on the final virus. And um, the encapsulation signal is not flanked by um, LOX P sites. We bring them into the same cell, uh, HEC293 Cree cells. We can see that this one will be spliced out. This remains. This makes all the right proteins in the right amounts at the right time. But it is this genome which will be packaged. And we have brought this now to less than um, sub-PPM uh, contamination. So how do we make the virus target the cells of interest? Now, this is what this icosahedron looks like. And at the five-fold axis, you have this fiber with a fiber knob. That's a homotrimer. And normally, this homotrimer interacts with the receptor on the other cell, which is called the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor. And the way it works is that three of these green guys come laterally and bind the knob. That's not what we want. And so therefore, we took our technology and actually selected DARPINs that bind to this and determined the crystal structure, as you see in a moment, um, where we found that the seed termini are all very close to each other. And so we actually were able to design a construct with just one single glycine and a super stable trimerization unit, which doesn't have any disulfides, but where the termini are wrapped around each other and which basically cannot dissociate. We can then extend the other side with a flexible linker of glycine serine and put here another retargeting unit, for example, it retargeting DARPIN, that now gives for each of these knobs three binding sites on the cell. This is what the structure would look like. Um, this is the knob. Um, these are the greens, are the three pronged DARPINs that bind to it. This is the trimerization unit, and of course the rest you cannot see because this is flexible. And so one of the nice things is that this basically doesn't dissociate from the virus for over 10 days. The reason we think is that in order for it to dissociate, all three green ones would have to, to come up at the same time, which is statistically very unlikely. And moreover, because this is not encoded on the virus, we can change the specificity of the same virus by just adding a new adapter, which we can produce in E. coli, and therefore test really literally dozens uh, of things very, very fast. Okay, the third issue is we have to shield the virus from interactions with blood components and non-specific interactions with cells. And so again, a look at, at the icosahedron, which for the uh, specialist has a triangulation number of 25, and so therefore has lots of these repeating hexon units, which consists of three proteins. Um, and so therefore we have an enormous number of threefold axes on this, on this uh, icosahedron. And so we thought we'll trimerize the SEFV that we had that binds to this as well. And so the, one of the nice things is this, of course, immediately increases the avidity to 10 picomolar, but perhaps more important, it now completely, co sorry, completely covers the virus. This is um, a uh, cryo-M structure together with my co co colleague Ohad Medalia of the naked virus and of the one that is, trimer that is shielded with this trimeric uh, sim single chain of V. And you can appreciate that really the whole sur surface is covered. If we now do the following experiment, we add the adapter to the naked virus and to the shielded virus and test uh, what, what happens, is we first see this is uh, without shield, this is with shield. Um, you can see basically it still can infect uh, via the adapter uh, as we like. If we now titrate in um, a neutralizing antibody in black, and this is a log scale, we can see that loses infectivity very fast, whereas the green one 
actually maintains it. So we thought this is very encouraging. And so then we went on to test this original idea whether we can actually encode multiple payloads in such a system. And so what you'll see here is the murine version of an anti-PD-1 antibody, um, the uh, murine IL-12 and the murine IL-2, and a construct which has all three in the same genome. And so what we can see, the effect on this tumor model, which is the B16 uh, immunocompetent model uh, overexpressing HER2, um, we can see that this is really um, uh, uh, handled quite well. And of course, the most effective construct is the one that has uh, both the cytokines as well as the anti-PD-1 in it. That this can also be seen in the survival curves. You might then ask the question, why don't you simply just mix these three viruses, you could, and this also is effective, but it is not as good as having at the same gene copy number um, everything in one construct, the reason being most likely that only in this case can you be sure that each cell gets all genes. In other cases, of course, you have the binomial probabilities. Okay, we were then interested in sort of understanding more what's going on and collaborated with Viviana Gardinaro at, at Caltech, who, whose lab has really um, developed this phenomenal technology called the clarity process. So the way it works is you take out the tumor from these mice, uh, seen here, and, and you cross-link the hell out of them, uh, adding formaldehyde, acrylamide in a hydrogel embedding, and really make a covalent mesh of all proteins that are in there. You then remove the lipids with high amounts of detergent. One can use electrophoresis or not. We didn't. Um, and then you have to add a solution that matches the refractive index. So there are no refractive index changes anymore, and there's no scattering. And so that way, the tumor becomes totally transparent. It literally looks like a drop of water. This is the same tumor. And so thereby, one can now do sophisticated light microscopy, which I'd like to share with you. And so um, what we see here uh, in the next slides is that the vasculature is stained red because this is with a uh, dilate uh, 649 tomato lectin. Um, we see the transduced cells in cyan, which is uh, indicating that the virus has infected them because it encodes EGFP, and it produces the antibody, which is detected with a yellow label um, detecting this human FC. And here we go. So this is, this is not an artist's rendering. This is real microscopy imaging data. And what we can see is uh, the vasculature has actually acquired holes. The virus obviously has left this and has left its mark by expressing uh, GFP, which you see by the cyan cells, and you can see the yellow, uh, again, this is a light microscopy, labeling of um, FC, uh, and this is the trastuzumab molecules which are filling the tumor from the inside. We think this is a, a, a very encouraging. And so we were interested in quantifying this further, and so, of course, if you have just, if you just inject PBS, you shouldn't see anything because there is no antibody. If we inject Herceptin as a protein, after 11 days, most of it has actually left the tumor and has gone to the liver, so this is much higher here. Whereas if you keep producing the trastuzumab right there, it still has, a, this, is, this is, I think, after 11 days, but this stays on for, six, for, for two months at least. Um, and there's very little in the liver, so they have a much more favorable gradient, which is, of course, very interesting for toxic compounds. And so just to summarize that part, is if we, um, we're literally treating the tumors from the inside out. Um, this is at day zero with PBS, uh, healthy vasculature. After 11 days, this starts to get holes. You see infected cells, a little bit of antibodies, and after two months, there are really literally holes in the tumor uh, that are filled with antibodies. There are still infected cells around. 
And so uh, we were, of course, interested in expanding this further. So I'll show you an example on tumor cells. We just have a paper in revision on infecting stromal cells as a sort of another production site. We're still working on the vasculature, and I just want to show you a few uh, slides on uh, infecting immune cells. So the, um, the motivation for this is, could we have ever think about making CAR T cells in vivo? So the idea of CAR T cells is, of course, to take T cells and give them a tumor specificity. In this slide, this looks deceptively simple, <laughs> which is to just take, uh, you know, take, take, take a, uh, in, 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 in this case, a lentivirus that encodes an SCFV anti-tumor, expand them, bring them um, back to the patient, and so on and so forth. This is a very complicated process requiring a personalized fermenter for every patient. And in Switzerland, these, um, these treatment costs between 400 and 500,000 per patient. So this is not going to be sustainable. And so the question is, could we replace all of this by a syringe and somehow at least find ways that the patient does all of this himself? And so in order to do this, we use the same technology um, use these, um, these engineered viruses. In this case, we actually need three different adapters on the same virus. We use an anti-CD3 single-chain FV fragment, we use an anti-CD28 single-chain FV fragment, and we use uh, IL-2 as the, as the cytokine, all linked to the um, this system. And what we found is, is actually kind of intriguing. We need all three, and the combination is far better than either one alone. Either one alone contributes, but the combination is best. Moreover, um, the best of all ratios is one to one to one, and one can calculate that this maximizes the chance that each virion has at least one of each receptors. And so, uh, just to show you uh, two, two um, in vivo highlights, in this particular case, we used an intraperitoneal um, model where first the human T cells were injected, then um, this virus. And again, this was uh, very encouraging. We um, hit um, both uh, major T cell subtypes, um, uh, CD4 and CD8, with preactivation but also without preactivation. Um, in this particular case, we also hit B cells because, of course, they also have the IL-2 receptor. Um, one could leave this out if this was of concern. We don't really hit NK and, and uh, cells and monocytes. But I think the most exciting experiment is this one, which is now a fully reconstituted mouse with a human immune system that has been established uh, by my, my colleague Christian Münz and colleagues. And so here they have a, 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 a human immune system. We come with this virus and actually can see that here in, in this mouse, we, we are hitting um, the T cells at a level that is sort of at the level what um, patients get when they have a CAR T cell therapy. So this is modest beginning, but we think this is still encouraging and we're getting the same quantitation looking at the IRFP, expressing cells and counting viral genomes. And so, again, uh, this paracrine delivery of biologics is encouraging, and uh, we have now really done all of, all of these cell types and have started another company to bring this forward. Um, if I have time, one more thing. Um, and this is uh, reagent antibodies, because this is, of course, of, of interest here as well. Um, now, what I want to share with you is sort of a totally orthogonal concept we've been working on for 10 years or so, which is, can we do better looking at linear epitopes? And so if we have a linear epitope um, where we would have now a protein that has the same periodicity as the linear epitope, would we be able to set up a modular system? And could we do this in a way that we avoid selection altogether and really use an engineering approach from pre-made parts? We cannot use antibodies for this, of course, because they don't have this um, periodicity. And so the first question you'll ask, are um, linear epitopes important? 
not necessarily on the cell surface on the outside, but on the inside, I think they are very much. So first of all, many of the extensively used techniques, such as Western blots, immunohistochemistry, not all people realize this, but denature the proteins completely, and you are looking at linear epitopes whether you want it or not. Um, peptide enrichment workflows from mass spectrometry uh, are based on binding uh, of uh, specific linear epitopes, of course, as well as the unstructured tails of proteins. Many have them. I guess we heard some, some examples in, 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 in Ivan's great lecture. Um, as well as, of course, the intracellular phosphorylation loops. Uh, nature uses, I guess, uh, binding or mo modification of unstructured parts to get away with not having to create a personal kinase for everybody, um, as well as the unstructured regions in uh, epigenetic changes in the histone tails, for example. So I think this is very important. And so the concept that we've been uh, developing is schematically shown here. The, let this be a linear epitope that runs from right to left where the amino acids are just shown by symbols. If we have particular binding pockets that are selective for these uh, particular uh, 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 units, we would be able to assemble a protein bind design that would predictably bind this particular epitope and therefore having done this, uh, without an experiment because all the experiments have already been done at the modular stage. That's essentially what we're developing. This would lead to a very rapid, cost-effective and pre-validated system. And so the basis that we're working on is a heavily engineered um, armadillo repeat protein unit where you have schematically shown in the, um, in the protein a particular epitope which is then bind bound unit by unit by these engineered proteins. And so just to uh, illustrate that this actually works, um, this, these are three particular epitopes for which we have made binders. Um, they're different. And so these uh, proteins have been added to HEC293 lysates and or not. And what we can appreciate is using these designed proteins as primary reagents in Western blots, you just light up this one band, which has exactly uh, the molecular weight that we think and is not there uh, in, the, in the empty HEC293 cells. And this is true for all three of these systems. Moreover, we can adjust the affinity by just adjusting the length. This is the same repetitive system where we have made the protein longer or the peptide longer and we can see that in the same system, we can choose any affinity between five micromolar and five picomolar and find the sweet spot where whatever assay works best. And this is just a, a one example of specificity where we have created a binder for this particular uh, peptide, um, uh, focusing on this particular leucine pocket. And now we test the binding of this peptide, which is exactly identical, except it carries an isoleucine here. So one methyl group moved within the side chain uh, from one carbon to the next. And that actually has a specificity of eightfold of the leucine against the isoleucine. We think this is quite kind of encouraging. We can do alanine scanning on this. This is the peptide that is being bound. This is the affinity, one over KD, so higher is better. Um, we uh, mutate one lysine to an alanine here or there. We lose exactly the same affinity. We, we mutate one arginine to an alanine here or there. We lose exactly the same affinity in both cases. Two lysines is additive from the free energy of binding. Two arginines are additive from the free energy of binding. And one lysine and one arginine, you can guess it, is the sum. So we hope that with this, uh, we will um, uh, perhaps replace this um, archaic uh, version of immunizing mice and perhaps even get around this universal library approach um, and uh, perhaps replace it by a system, at least for in these cases where there's no target prep, no selection, no screening. The customer tells the sequence and we say, this is your binder. We're of course not there yet, but at least the first baby steps have been made. 
So I guess my conclusion is the combination of protein design and evolution is, I think, quite powerful. And I have the privilege of working with phenomenal team. These are the people who have worked on the HER2 projects. Uh, CryoM has been, has been done mostly by Santiago Vaca, together with Ohad Medaglia and uh, Jose Maria Carazzo in Madrid, who has really developed computational methods for this. Team doing the high, high, high throughput selection, the adenovirus um, project, the Armadillo engineering, and fantastic collaborators that I have mentioned while we went along. So I'm at the end, and thank you very much for your attention. Please, if you have questions, come up to the floor mics in each aisle. We have time for a few. So, um, yeah, uh, Andreas, uh, that was a great talk. So the, uh, the uh, system at the end with the armadillo repeats and the peptides, it's very interesting. And I thought about this a lot. And, but so isn't it an assumption in that design that there's additive free energy of the amino acids, you know, the sort of being read out in kind of, kind of an additive way? And, and secondly, is, is your idea that you would engineer each armadillo repeat against each sequence or that you would eventually have some predictive power? Yes. Okay, so these, are, these are great questions. So. Um, the, um, the design of the pockets is a mixture between computational and experimental, and the, um, ex the uh, experimental data suggests that in the first approximation, um, these things are additive. Not completely, there has to be some fine tuning, and it doesn't have to be quantitatively additive. And I think the most important thing is each pocket is actually selected not for the tightest binding, but for the highest selectivity. That's really what we've been putting a lot of effort into developing the methodology. And I think in selectivity, uh, experiments are still better than computation. Computation is great in getting binding, but you also have to get rid of the other 19. And that's the challenge. And I think our selection systems have been better uh, at this point. Now, it's not totally um, additive, but in many cases, I would say in the first approximation, and that has allowed us to bring together these binders that I have shown in the Western blots that are really put together from things that had been previously um, engineered in a different context. So, uh, yeah, Andreas, I, I really uh, loved your uh, early papers on engineering FABs. Um, and, you know, that, that was beautiful. I, I wish you were still doing that in some respects, you know, it would be helpful. For, for the people working on antibodies. Um, but, um, so I, I have several, and I also want to compliment you on the engineering of the adenoviruses. I mean, that is just incredible engineering, you know, to go through all the different things you've done inside the virus, you know, as well as outside. It's just, just, just stunning. Uh, really, really a beautiful example of engineering. Um, so, and an observation that, um, so you had an, uh, you demonstrated by cryoEM that you could have two different uh, confirmations of an antibody bound to HER2, which is interesting. Um, and you thought that one of those confirmations might be incompatible with, with um, function. Um, we we found that, that um, some therapeutic antibodies don't block uh, by um, competitive binding. Actually, we, we found uh, for um, <clears throat> natalizumab, which um, is the approved drug for multiple sclerosis from Biogen, that it binds um, non-competitively um, uh, to the integrin. Um, you know, so I, I think that the um, constant domains of the FAB are getting in the way, and that causes the non the non-competitive binding. Um, but so your I want to ask about the, uh, the <clears throat> biperitopic binding and um, making those linear uh, concatamers, which, which is, you know, pr pretty striking. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, so how EGFR signals is not, you know, completely known. 
Um, and it appears to be much more than binding of the um, EGF to, um, to dimerize uh, two monomers, you know, to link them together. There, uh, John Curian and, and uh, others have evidence for um, larger multimers on the cell surface and suggest that there's additional contacts there that are important. So have you checked um, any of um, these antibodies or DARPNs you've looked at for whether they would interfere with those uh, larger multimers? And are, would you also be able to mimic formation of those larger multimers okay. to get signaling? With, with some of your darkens or antibodies? That was a whole series of questions. <laughs> Let me well, try so to... the first ones were comments, go, you know. Go, go, was, go. First ones were just comments. Go, go, the last go ones were step questions. by step. Um, so so the, 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 the structures we found in the, um, in the Herceptin complex indeed say this is an indirect competition. The antibody doesn't get into the way, but it, it favors a confirmation which cannot form the dimer. So it's an indirect confirmation, uh, indirect effect, and not a direct sort of simple blocking, as as people might have assumed. Yeah, and, and have you have you verified that by doing the com you know doing the assays on the cell surface for competitive? Okay, so what what, we, what we've finding? done is is in a in in a way doing um, uh, doing a comp competition between the various reagents, and it is actually true that if you have these biparatopic agents and add trastuzumab or pertuzumab on top, you make it worse because you you interfere with this favorable um, daisy chaining and bringing it in by having a simple binder which sort of gets rid of the more, um, uh, a more effective reagent. Um, is that a, a, a concept which is true for all surface proteins? Probably not, um, but it is obviously something that has been empirically found more or less following the um, lead of maximizing apoptosis with these reagents. That's basically the the, the, the readout that we were following all along. Thank you for the really great talk. I was really fascinated by the in vivo um, CAR T cell ideas that you had. And uh, when you mentioned IL-2, it reminded me that perhaps maybe it's targeting T regs more because they have a higher affinity for IL-2. But then it got me thinking whether you have any thoughts on strategies for gating on certain cells that have a certain affinity for, per se, IL-2 or other receptors, or ways to sort of negatively select for cells when infecting as opposed to positively selecting. Yes, absolutely. So, so, I mean, many of these things are being pursued at the company on a, on a much larger scale. I mean, we, of course, had to do the initial experiments in the, um, in the academic lab, and also uh, different versions of the IL-2 um, itself, uh, of course, of which many mutants have been made, uh, are, uh, are used. In this case, I, I can say that we had the best effect with the wild type, uh, which is actually an, an interesting observation. Thank you very much.